what I want to talk about today is um, some MMT insights for the Biden administration. We're, we're living in this uh, historic moment uh, in, in the history of the U.S. We have lots of challenges. Uh, I don't need to describe them to you. I'll describe some of them. But obviously, the, the pandemic situation is, is still raging um, on top of all the other crises that we've had for, for a long time now. So um, I'd like to invite you to think um, radically, uh, radically in the linguistic sense of the term, meaning going to the roots of the problems. And that's what I would like the Biden administration to, um, to embrace, uh, radical, bold, transformative ideas. So why we need to be radicals? We have deep structural problems. This is beyond the pandemic. Um, a climate crisis, inequality crisis, a socioeconomic exclusion crisis, a dysfunctional political system, uh, and the establishment is looking somehow for incremental, gradualist, bipartisan solutions, which to me, this is what superficial status quo solutions are. Right? This is the textbook definition of status quo, is when you go, when you're facing structural problems and you're addressing it with superficial kind of window dressing type of solutions. Uh, radical means going to the roots of the problem. Um, if we have structural systemic problems, we have to address them at the roots. Uh, the opposite of radical change is superficial change. There's no other way of defining it. And we can't afford superficial change at this point, given all these crises that we, that we have. I remember what Martin Luther King said, uh, in, the, in the context of the civil rights movement. He said, I have no time for the tranquilizing drug of gradualism and incrementalism. And, and I think our situation today calls for a similar reflection. I'm paraphrasing, obviously, uh, the context is slightly different, but the urgency uh, is, uh, is similar. The political establishment of the, what I call dysfunctional political system is trying to convince us that incremental bipartisan solutions uh, is, is what we need, is what we can afford, is what we can handle. And to me, as I said, that's the textbook formula for the status quo, and that's unaffordable. So the boldest, most transformative policy platform that we currently have uh, that addresses all of these crises simultaneously, not one by one in a gradualist way, is the Green New Deal. So I want to, you know, quickly summarize what the idea behind the Green New Deal is and then move into the core of the MMT principles, which is uh, a major source of support for, for the Green New Deal. So we have uh, structural problems, as I mentioned earlier. This is why we need a transformative um, uh, Green New Deal type of uh, program to address the inequality issues, the opioid crisis, the low paying jobs crisis, the unaffordable housing, education, health, all of these things need to be addressed at the same time, not one by one. Um, what is the Green New Deal? Well, we have a resolution. We don't have an actual you know, bill for the Green New Deal. It's inspired by the New Deal of the 1930s, right? Uh, during the Great Depression. Uh, the New Deal of the 1930s wasn't just one bill or one administration and one program. It was a whole alphabet soup of, you know, bills and administrations that were introduced over a 10-year period to radically transform the U.S. economy and address the mass unemployment, poverty, and, and socioeconomic exclusion of, of the time. It wasn't perfect, but we've learned a lot from it. And a lot of the resources that were built during the 1930s are still with us today. I encourage you to check out the website called the Living New Deal. Uh, I think it's called livingnewdeal.org. And it's got a map of the US. You can look up your own state, your own uh, hometown, and find the things that the New Deal administration, that the New Deal workers built in the 1930s that are still around to this day. Um, number one, the Green New Deal must be federally funded. This is a core idea. So the burden is not gonna be on states and municipalities to, to foot the bill. It's locally implemented in a decentralized way, just like the New Deal of the 1930s, which was implemented in every congressional district, a Green New Deal needs to be decentralized because the needs of different counties and different communities will be different. Um, and who's the most qualified to identify the needs of the community other than locals, uh, grassroots organizations, local city councils, and, uh, and civic associations, and so on. 
Um, it needs to be urban and rural. We, we can't afford the, the rising inequality and, and the degradation of the infrastructure that we see in, in rural areas across the United States. Uh, it can't be uh, a jobs program where if you need the jobs, if you want the jobs, you have to move to the big cities to, to find them. Uh, so rural development is extremely important. We've done this in the 1930s with rural electrification, among other things. Today, we need rural broadbandification of the whole country and modernization of the grid and much, much more. It needs to be inclusive. The New Deal of the 1930s was not inclusive. It was the United States of the 1930s with segregation and racism and, and so on. Uh, the, the Green New Deal must be inclusive. We can't repeat the same mistakes of, of the 1930s, obviously. It needs to be just in the, in the sense of just transition as in guaranteeing that workers who will be displaced from say the fossil fuel industry or other industries will be guaranteed a job at living wages and benefits uh, and at comparable wages and benefits for fossil fuel workers who make six figures in, in some parts of the country, uh, especially mid-career workers. We can't just call it just transition and ask them to take you know, a 50% salary cut. Uh, we need to at least grandfather in the uh, more senior workers in the fossil fuel industry at comparable benefits and, and, and salary packages that, that takes care of them throughout uh, their, uh, the rest of their career and, and retirement. It needs to be a restorative in the sense of restoring the social fabric, the economic fabric that's been neglected and destroyed over the last four decades at least. And it needs to be comprehensive and permanent. In other words, we can't do this one bit at a time. It needs to be all at once. It needs to be this multi-pronged uh, program. And we can't go back. Uh, once we decarbonize, once we address the, the broken socioeconomic uh, structures, we can't let that happen again. Uh, in other words, the new structures that we introduce that are just, uh, that are equitable, that are sustainable, we need to preserve them uh, moving forward. So the big question is, how do we pay for all of these bold transformative programs? We're told that the government is broke. We're running out of dollars. There's no tax money. Uh, it's going to be a huge burden on future generations if we just you know, borrow and borrow and borrow. It's going to be hyperinflation, Zimbabwe, Venezuela, the, you know, the, the usual hyperinflation stories that you hear. And we're going to have to borrow a lot of money from, from China to do this. And I think many of you uh, heard um, uh, the senator from Utah yesterday tell uh, uh, you know, CNN that we can't afford to borrow more money from China. Uh, I'm blanking on uh, his name. Um, somebody <laughs> correct me here. Um, anyway. Call their bluff when they hear when you hear these stories. And and here's how you're gonna call their bluff. Romney. Mitt Romney, thank you. Senator Romney was on CNN yesterday saying mm -hmm. we can't borrow more money from China. Uh, we're you know too much debt. So how did we pay for World War II? Let me ask you this question. World War II was one of the most expensive programs in the history of the universe, probably, and it came right after the Great Depression, the most miserable time in, in US history. There's no money to be taxed. There was no money to be borrowed uh, in the US or internationally because the Great Depression was global. Um, was World War II affordable uh, for the US to enter the war? Uh, did anybody in, uh, in Congress at the time uh, say, well, this, this war effort is gonna be too expensive. How about we, we do a gradualist approach to World War II? How about we send them 10,000 troops at a time and see if we can scare the Nazis away? Well, of course not. That was not the way we entered the war. That was not the way uh, the U.S. won the war. Um, where did the money come from to pay for the war? And a lot of people have this idea that we taxed the rich or we taxed corporations. It didn't happen before the war. A lot of people have this idea that we borrowed. There was war bonds. There was freedom bonds. Again, it didn't happen before the war. All of those things happened during and after the war not before the war. So the question about how do we actually pay for a massive program immediately, like World War II, like a Green New Deal today, like the CARES Act, was the same way the federal government always spends, which is spending money into existence. The federal government, the US Congress, 
has the power of the purse. So unlike you and I, we can't print our own money, obviously. Businesses can't do that. States and municipalities can't do that. The federal government can. So the question is always not about you know, finding the money because the federal government has the money, can create the money. The question is about mobilizing the real resources, the productive capacity to produce tanks and airplanes to actually win the war. Um, similarly today, the challenge is gonna be finding the engineering capabilities and the solar panel productive capabilities and the wind turbines and the, and the fiber optic capabilities to, to you know, modernize the grid and modernize uh, the internet infrastructure and so on. So shifting the discussion from finding the money to actually finding the votes in the US Congress because that's what it takes to actually approve the spending is the 535 people we sent to Washington, D.C. Their responsibility is to appropriate financial resources to uh, fund national priorities. And I would argue that these are some of our national priorities that I'll discuss today. We don't have to go back to World War II. Let's, uh, let's uh, go back a few months ago. The CARES Act. How did we pay for it? Who did we tax? Who did we borrow from? Did uh, Trump at the time or Mnuchin or anybody in Congress say, we have to tax this to pay for that, or we need to borrow from China to pay for the CARES Act, uh, you know, pandemic relief spending? Of course not. Here's what happened. A few days, a few weeks before uh, the pandemic started, almost everybody in DC was convinced that, that there was no money for a Green New Deal, no money for uh, Medicare for all, that we're broke, we have no financial resources. And all of a sudden the pandemic hits and 535 people show up and vote for a national priority spending, the, the pandemic economic relief, the, the CARES Act. And all of a sudden $2.2 trillion were spent into existence without taxing anybody, without borrowing from anybody. And it was um, unanimous, everybody, voted in favor of the CARES Act. The only four people who didn't vote were either, you know, either had COVID or were exposed to it, so they, they couldn't show up in, in person to vote. But it was unanimous, essentially. And what adds to this fact, again, is that uh, Trump and Mnuchin showed up at the same time. This was in, in March, obviously, and said, you know what, April 15th is around the corner. That's when usually people pay taxes to the federal government. Don't worry about it. We don't need your tax money. We're going to postpone tax day to July 15th. So again, we didn't tax anybody. We didn't borrow from anybody. This is how the federal government always spends on national priorities. So the concern is not about finding the money. It's about finding the votes. But then the real economic concern is once we spend the money into the system, what will people do with it? They're going to go out and spend they're going to buy houses, cars, transportation, entertainment, whatever. It's a free country, right? So that's where the concern, you know, uh, becomes real. So during World War II, the concern was if those workers that we just hired to build tanks and, and airplanes, if they go out and want to buy a new house and a new car, they will not be able to get one because we've exhausted all the labor and productive capacity, we've shifted it to produce military equipment and we stopped producing enough consumer goods. So those workers would have gone out on a shopping spree and would have caused inflation. So what did we do to prevent that inflation from happening? We started selling freedom bonds. We started different policies and different tools to manage the risk of inflation. So when people say, oh, the government borrowed, we, we sold freedom bonds and, and war bonds during the war. Well, it wasn't to fund the war because the war was already funded. The purpose of those bonds was to essentially tell workers, please postpone your consumption until after the war. Don't buy that house. Don't buy that car. Save your money. And government guaranteed AAA rated bonds. We promise to pay you back plus interest after the war in 10 years and 15 years and, and so on. Uh, so that was one of the tools to manage the risk of inflation. Obviously, we had to be even more aggressive in terms of managing the, the scarce resources like rubber and steel and things like that. Uh, and, and, and those are extreme measures, you know, price controls and things like that. So it's always the risk of inflation that matters. And this is really the core of, of the MMT principle. MMT is essentially telling us that 
the spending capacity of the federal government is much, much larger than what most people think. It's not unlimited. Uh, there is a real limit, but that real limit is not tax revenues or, or, or borrowing capacity. And I'll get to that in a second. So the federal government in the US has a very high degree of monetary sovereignty. And that's a core concept in, in the MMT literature, which means that the federal government and this is how we define monetary sovereignty. The federal government issues its own currency, the U.S. dollar, um, collects taxes in the same national currency in U.S. dollars, and the federal government only issues bonds denominated in U.S. dollars. In other words, we don't borrow and promise to pay back in euros or, or Japanese yen or, or Canadian dollars or any foreign currency, which means when those bonds come due, there is no risk of insolvency for the federal government. It can always create money into existence to meet its, its, its commitment. It doesn't mean that we should have unlimited borrowing and unlimited spending, but it means that any borrowing the government does, quote unquote borrowing, it's very different than my borrowing from a bank or your borrowing from, from a credit card company and so on. And then the last feature of U.S. monetary sovereignty is that we don't fix the value of the dollar to gold or silver or any other currency. In other words, the value of the dollar uh, internationally operates under a flexible exchange rate system. It's not a fixed exchange rate system like the gold standard. And that creates a high degree of monetary sovereignty for the United States. It's a degree of monetary sovereignty, obviously, that we acquired over time with economic strength. It doesn't mean that any country can just declare monetary sovereignty by decree. You have to actually acquire the economic capabilities to uh, reach this level of economic resilience. An important distinction that MMT makes uh, that I'll emphasize here is the distinction between what we call currency issuer, which is the federal government and the US in this case, versus the rest of us, currency users. You and I, you know, states and municipalities, uh, private businesses and consumers and household, all of us and the rest of the world, we're users of the US dollar. We have to earn it before we can spend it. We can't spend it into existence. The federal government, on the other hand, can spend it into existence. And as a result, it operates in a completely different um, space in terms of what it can do uh, in terms of spending on, on national priorities. So the distinction here is important. In other words, when everything you hear me say about the federal government today, uh, don't try this at home. You know, don't, don't go spending <laughs> and thinking that, that you can do this. Only the federal government can do it. That's why I say it's important for something like the, the Green New Deal to be funded by the federal government, not by states and municipalities, because they don't have that spending capacity. So uh, a, a little note so that um, after this, when people hear you talking about MMT, they say, oh, we, we heard about MMT. It doesn't work in Venezuela. It doesn't work in Greece. It doesn't work in uh, uh, other places. Well, remember I said the U.S. has a very high degree of monetary sovereignty or financial sovereignty. Some countries have no financial sovereignty, no monetary sovereignty whatsoever because they've given up their national currency. So that will be the, the case of uh, a country like Ecuador. Uh, so everything I uh, explain here doesn't apply to Ecuador because it doesn't have the capacity to issue its own currency. Uh, it doesn't, none of this applies to it. It's a currency user. Some countries have um, gone into a situation where they borrow and promise to pay in a foreign currency, like most developing countries have an external debt denominated in dollars and euros and Japanese yen. Those countries lost part of their monetary sovereignty as a, as a result they have a much lower degree of monetary sovereignty. So different countries are placed in different spots on the spectrum. Uh, what I wanna focus on today is a country like the US for, for our purposes. I'm happy to discuss developing countries at, at some other time. Um, but everything I say today applies to a country like the US with very high degree of monetary sovereignty. So the limit that constrains US spend and I insist and I repeat that MMT never says that spending is unlimited. There is a real limit. But unlike what most people think, the limit is not how much the federal government can collect in tax revenues or how much the government can borrow from private lenders and, and the bond market. That's the mainstream approach. MMT says the limit is much larger. It's 
constrained by the risk of inflation. So there's this additional spending capacity that we're ignoring, that we're told that we can't you know, venture into because it's going to cause hyperinflation, because it's going to bankrupt the country and, and all the usual things you hear in the media. So for MMT, we're laser focused on that barrier, the risk of inflation. And it's actually... Uh, kind of funny when mainstream economists and politicians say MMTers don't care about inflation. I always say MMTers are obsessed with the risk of inflation. <laughs> that's what we focus on. That's really the core of um, uh, that, that determines how much additional spending we have. So the real limit is inflation. And what determines inflation? Two things. One is the lack of productive capacity. In other words, if we ran out of physical productive resources, skilled people, machinery, equipment, know-how, technology, physical resources, then we hit the inflation barrier. Then any spending beyond that point will be inflationary. The good news about productive capacity is that it's generally producible. We can train people. We can produce more machinery. We can produce more research and development and better know-how and better technology, which means with proper strategic industrial uh, uh, investment and, and planning, we can actually acquire larger and larger productive capacity, create millions of jobs, and as a result, expand the spending capacity over time by building more productive capacity. That's sort of the easy part in terms of mitigating the risk of inflation. The second uh, component of the risk of inflation has to do with what I call the abusive market power and price setting behavior. Um, th this is, you know, think of big pharma, Wall Street, uh, big oil, you know, companies that can set prices, that can raise prices simply because they can, because they have too much power, because they've gone for too long unregulated. Think of, you know, monopoly power, abusive price uh, setting behavior. Uh, and all I have to mention is health insurance companies or, you know, energy companies or your, your local internet uh, provider. They, they raise your <laughs> monthly bill every month. And um, whether you like it or not, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, very little competition and too much market power. So that kind of inflation risk is not going to be eliminated by spending less or spending more. That risk of inflation can only be eliminated by taxing and regulating their market power out of existence. In other words, by democratizing those specific markets. And whose responsibility is to do this? It's obviously the 535 people we send to Washington, D.C. to do this job. The only problem is if they're campaigns are funded by super PACs from Wall Street, from pharmaceuticals, from big oil, it's not going to happen. So this is a question of democracy. This is a question of corruption in the system. So when you hear people saying taking money out of politics, it's really about this. It's not about um, you know, the government uh, not, uh, not having the capacity to spend or anything like that. So that's the focus of, of our um, you know, kind of the way we determine the maximum capacity of the economy to spend. And if we're able to tax and regulate the market power out of existence in these particular industries, we are able actually to remove this force that actually suffocates the spending capacity of the government and as a result, expand this additional spending capacity. And that's how we afford a Green New Deal. That's how we afford all the ambitious programs uh, that I laid out uh, a few minutes ago. So we're talking about a paradigm shift in terms of how we think about um, the level of spending that the federal government is actually capable of, of doing. So one of the key features of the MMT analysis, now that we understand that the federal government is not constrained by taxes or by borrowing, what we do is we decouple the spending from taxing. Both are extremely important, but they're not necessarily linked in the usual way you think about it. Because most people at the state or municipal level, they think, oh, in order to spend more on building a, you know, a school building, we have to raise tax revenues. So you tax in order to spend. At the federal government, these things are decoupled. We can spend more without having to worry about taxing a particular thing at a particular level at a particular time. So how do we do it? We spend on national priorities. We tax pollution because we want to decarbonize, not because we need their money or their permission to fund healthcare. 
or education. We tax speculation on Wall Street because we need to stabilize the economy and reduce their excessive you know, speculative behavior, uh, not because we need their money or their permission for a particular program. You tax extreme wealth um, and the oligarchs, not because we need their money or their permission for uh, better infrastructure, but because we want to protect democracy from the oligarchy. We, re we want to reduce inequality. We want to reduce the abusive market power and so on. So decouple the two. This is really um, a, a, a different way of thinking about the possibilities, right? So hashtag goals. So setting the national priorities. This is what I have in mind. First, we talk about universal public services. A country like the US with the technological capabilities and, and, and productive capacity we have, we can afford to invest in green infrastructure, medical for all, uh, housing for all, education for all, childcare for all. These are universal, you know, what do we call them? Human rights, right? For a country like the US, we can afford these things. There's no reason for us not to have uh, this as a basis for uh, everyone in this country. Number two, a federal job guarantee for people who want to work and can't find work in the private sector at living wages and benefits. And, and to me, this, is a, this has to be a core feature of the Green New Deal, not, a, not an add-on uh, core feature because of the just transition concept that I talked about. Because this massive transformation will displace a lot of workers from the fossil fuel industry, from the uh, healthcare, you know, uh, billing and paperwork pushing uh, industry. Millions of workers will be displaced. A job guarantee is a core feature for that transition. It can't be just an afterthought. And then the third thing that we can afford in the U.S. is a generous income support for people who can't work. So universal services, a job guarantee, and then a generous income support for people who, who can't work. Uh, a job guarantee is obviously for people who want to work, right? It's not a make work program. It's not a, a workfare program or anything like that. There's millions of people want to work and can't find employment in the private sector. A little note here on the pandemic, when, when the pandemic hit and people said, well, how does uh, the job guarantee fit in here? Well, remember when the pandemic started, you know, what did the scientists and, the, and, uh, and people in the healthcare industry tell us? They told us that the most important job is to stay home, right? If you can work from home, go for it. But if you can't, and this is why we sent so many millions of people home. So for me, during a pandemic, uh, people being sent home because they can't work remotely or can't work in, in person because of the shutdown. Uh, that's where a job guarantee is because that's one of the most important jobs to keep people safe. So a little note on, on inflation here. As I said, MMT is, uh, is sort of obsessed with the risk of inflation. What do mainstream economists say about inflation, say, in the last 10 years? Because, you know, they told us that the quantitative easing and the aftermath of 2008 is going to cause inflation and hyperinflation. We're going to bankrupt the country with big deficits in the U.S. and Europe and Japan. This is what the Fed says. This is mainstream economists. We have no reliable theory of inflation because everything they've predicted since 2008 about inflation, about interest rates, has been wrong. Uh, they've tried every trick in the textbook, in the mainstream textbook, to you know, manage to target inflation, and they failed miserably, and they've acknowledged it. And yet somehow they you know, somehow know for sure that the Green New Deal will be inflationary. They say, we don't have a theory of inflation, yet we know that the Green New Deal at some point will be inflationary, which is hypocritical, uh, to say the least. So from an MMT perspective, here are the drivers of inflation in the U.S. economy today. Four areas, healthcare, education, housing, energy, and transportation. So when you look at the Green New Deal package that most of us in the MMT community insist on, we insist on Medicare for all. We insist on college and vocational training for all. We insist on home guarantee and rent control. We insist on decarbonizing the economy. Why? because this is how you target these, the roots of inflation. Notice also the power and influence of key players in these industries, right? So tax and regulate their market power out of existence. That's number one. Number two, build the productive capacity, train more doctors, more nurses, build more hospitals. That's how you make the resources, the services available 
not exclusive. And that's how you tame the, the, the abusive uh, price setting behavior of key players in these industries. And obviously you decarbonize and you create a much more sustainable and equitable system. So to me, my, my worst nightmare would be for the Green New Deal label to, to become popular in Washington DC and to be you know, implemented without actually targeting the roots of inflation by taxing and regulating their market power out of existence and without building the productive capacity to make this, uh, to make the actual services available to everybody. I'll give you a quick example just to illustrate. Let's say uh, tomorrow President Biden says, you know what, uh, dental care is a human right. We're going to guarantee this to every person in the United States call your dentist and schedule an appointment, it's free. It's covered by the federal government. Well, I pick up the phone, call my dentist and say, I'd, I'd like to come in for uh, you know, a regular visit for a dental hygiene visit. And they say, well, sure, well, we're happy to take you. Uh, the next available appointment is, is January, 2029, right? We're booked up, we have no productive capacity, right? That doesn't help anybody. And then they say, well, if you really wanna um, you know, uh, come in earlier. We do have an appointment next Wednesday, but it's for premium gold membership. It's $10,000 a year, right? Uh, again, it's exclusive. It doesn't serve the purposes. It's inflationary because we haven't built up the productive capacity to actually serve uh, every person in, in the U.S. So build the productive capacity and reduce the abusive price setting behavior both at the same time. So market power and productive capacity are the name of the game when it comes to uh, shifting, um, you know, moving us from, from these crises. So when they say we can't afford it, when they say the deficit is too big, when they say the national debt is too high, we need to change the narrative. Can we afford this? When they say the deficit, it's the deficit of infrastructure that matters not the government deficit. It's the deficit of uh, water resources. It's the climate debt that matters, not the national debt. These are the things that we can't afford, right? And many of these things will be happening at a much higher frequency. Many of you in different parts of the country have experienced the, the forest fires and the floods and the, and the lead and the, and, and the pipes and the water and, and so on. So what we need, you know, at the national level is a, is a paradigm shift in terms of the very metric that we use for public policy, for economic policy. So most people are obsessed with the idea of economic growth because we're told with more economic growth, we create wealth and with more wealth, we can afford nicer things and better things and cleaner things and healthier things. So the first thing to do is economic growth. So how do we get economic growth? More fracking will get us more economic growth. It creates the jobs and creates the wealth. And with that wealth, you can afford healthcare. That's just backwards, right? So GDP is the measure that economists use for economic growth. And it's a very misleading measure. It's actually a very dangerous measure. Why? Because every time somebody goes for um, medical treatment because of breathing problems related to pollution, GDP goes up every time you spend, GDP goes up. Every time we build a prison because there's more crime, GDP goes up. Every time we pay for cancer treatment for everybody in town uh, because the water source is pollution, GDP goes up. Every time we clean up an oil spill, GDP goes up. So all of these negative effects on our quality of life are actually celebrated on TV. They say, yay, GDP went up by 3%, more economic growth, more wealth for the United States. But obviously our quality of life is deteriorating because of all of these things. So the alternative measure that MMT economists and ecological economists prefer to use is GPI, Genuine Progress Indicator. And this is the data for the US, roughly speaking. The last 30 years, we have uh, essentially flat quality of life and yet economic growth is happening. This is a serious problem. So when we say shift the paradigm, shift the metric, focus on GPI, quality of life indicators, then the next question becomes, okay, what are the things that will actually increase GPI over time and increase our quality of life? And it turns out to be the entire list you have under the Green New Deal program. When you invest in people, 
when you invest in communities, when you invest in clean energy. And, you know, not trying to be uh, funny here, but, you know, uh, pun intended, this is common sense for the average Joe, right? What does the average Joe think? The average Joe knows that we'd rather spend money on, you know, summer camps to inspire kids with music and theater, robotics, and, and, or not do that because it's too expensive. And then for the next, you know, 15, 20 years, deal with the opioid crisis, with the unemployment crisis, build more prisons for those same kids. The average Joe knows that it's obviously more common sense to spend on those kids while they're young to inspire them and to build the future generation. Again, the average Joe knows that we'd rather clean up the water source instead of having to pay many times over for the next 30 years spending on cancer treatment for everybody in, in the city. Right. So these are common sense things that the GPI gives us the metric for, that the Green New Deal gives us the pathway to eliminating the costs, the hidden costs that we are already paying for. So when they say we can't afford the Green New Deal, you need to shift the narrative and say, wait a minute, we're already paying for you know, all of these necessary evils many, many times over what the Green New Deal will actually cost. The Green New Deal is actually the cheap version, the less painful version, the more prosperous version. So if anything, we can't afford not to you know, embrace these transformative policies. So change the narrative. To conclude, we have less than 10 years to act. Uh, and, and I didn't say anything about the, the rest of the world. This is really a global crisis, not just the US. Uh, 10 years to act on a transformative uh, kind of bold way, not to think and debate and, and wonder about might this work, might it uh, not work. Um, the climate crisis, inequality, poverty, exclusion, the injustice, call for urgent and bold transformative actions, not small, you know, incremental solutions. The current policies on climate and jobs are too weak, too slow, too expensive, and they don't even work. So uh, economic justice, and climate justice via a living wage Green New Deal are possible, desirable, and, and affordable. And it's, it's really the current status quo, as I said a minute ago, that's unaffordable. We can't afford not to you know, uh, uh, transition into a Green New Deal mode and transform the economy in the way I described today. So think of the cost of doing nothing, right? Just imagine the cost of doing nothing in 10 years and 20 years and 30 and 50 years, the science is there. We know what's going to happen if we don't act in a transformative way. And the question about how do we pay for it without bankrupting the country, without inflation, without all of this, this is where MMT becomes critical because the mainstream of the economics profession essentially tells us that we can't afford these things. Why? Because their theory about inflation, the theory about what the government can afford um, happens to be fiscally conservative. Notice even the liberal economists in the mainstream, what are they saying today? They're saying, oh, we can spend a little bit now on pandemic relief and a little bit on climate. You know why? Because interest rates are so low. We have to borrow right now and spend. Otherwise, it will be too expensive in five years and six years. So this is the time to build infrastructure and all that. And guess what? Those same economists using the same logic in five years where interest rates are a little bit higher, they say, no, 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 no. We can't spend anymore. We can't borrow anymore. It's too expensive. We can't afford it. It's going to bankrupt the country. So the logic is flawed. The logic is dangerous. And those are the same economists who are wrong about inflation, wrong about climate change, wrong about inequality, wrong about virtually everything that matters. So MMT provides an alternative framework. It's more empirically robust and it's uh, logical. Um, and and, and I'm, I'm here to answer any questions related to this framework. I'll just close by saying one thing about uh, you know, the last few days or the, f the, the first few days of the Biden administration and things that, that look promising. Um, uh, number one, obviously, you know, the, what happened on the first day with the executive orders was, was a sigh of relief on, on so many fronts for, for many people. Um, but even before the Biden administration was, was sworn in, uh, Congress uh, uh, introduced 
uh, in terms of the, the rules that the Democratic Party, Nancy Pelosi and others negotiated for, for this Congress, one of them was to exempt climate-related spending, pandemic-related spending from the pay-go rules. In other words, if you want to spend on climate, if you want to spend on, on health and, and pandemic relief related uh, items, those items don't need to be offset by other tax revenues or by other spending cuts in the federal budget. That's an important thing, which means we have the capacity to spend. And even these artificial rules that Congress created for itself, like the PAYGO rules, uh, climate and pandemic relief is exempt from it. That's number one. Number two, one of the executive orders that went uh, sort of unnoticed, kind of hidden in the legal language, uh, was an executive order that essentially uh, asked the, uh, the director of the Office of Budget, um, blanking on the acronym, uh, the OBE, uh, to uh, modernize, to look into the modernization of the regulatory framework that the federal government uses. And in that language was very clear, uh, a language about prioritizing uh, health, uh, racial equity, social justice, uh, environmental, um, uh, 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 environmental regulation. But in that same sentence appears the, the phrase and economic growth. Uh, so yes, it's encouraging that any new budget, any new regulatory framework introduced by the federal government related to spending will have to focus on quality of life indicators. But then that economic growth thing was thrown in there, which tells me we still have some work to do, which means if we prioritize economic growth in the way I explained earlier, then the argument is going to be, well, we prioritize economic growth, it generates wealth, and then we can use it to provide social justice and racial justice and environmental justice. Uh, I don't think, I think that's incoherent. Um, that's, that's still confused. But if we take that concept of economic growth and switch to GPI as a key indicator, then the whole thing becomes coherent. You can get racial justice and social justice and environmental justice with an increase in quality of life as measured by GPI investments and, and so on. So those are the, the final closing thoughts on, uh, on, on what's possible. And remember what FDR said, um, you know, and this is, you know, um, uh, something that uh, many of you have heard before when he says, you've convinced me, I agree, now make me do it, right? Now, this is the challenge for all of us. Even if you get President Biden to agree, on climate issues, on economic justice and social justice issues, which I think it's very clear that, you know, he cares, his administration cares about these issues. Now is the time to make him do it, which means build the social movements, build the pressure on your representatives in Congress and the Senate, the 535 people who will actually push these legislations through, um, through Congress. This is what we need to do in the next uh, two years. Um, at least we have a window of two years. Who knows what happens uh, after 2022? So with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you again for, for your time. My question is, how do we avoid this being an argument between socialism and private enterprise or some of us who have done pretty well in our economy under private enterprise? Is this not an argument like that? So notice none of the things introduced here are going to take away private property or, or take away uh, competition or freedom of choice or self-interest. These are the core features of the free market, according to Milton Friedman, not me, right? So if anything, I'm talking about enhancing competition, right? Not reducing competition. I'm talking about, you know, um, you know, transforming the structure of the economy so that the rest of us can thrive in a in a capitalist system, in a you know competitive system that that you know treats people with dignity, uh, that treats nature with dignity. Uh, it's not about moving to socialism and taking over private property or any of that. Now, if there's abusive price setting behavior, if there's monopoly power, you know the the most capitalist person in in the last uh, hundred years, Milton Friedman will tell you, break the monopolies, take away their price setting behavior, and and all of that. So well, I have none to of go that is through uh, the government to uh, get an appointment with my dentist. No, why? Why would you have to do that? So, who well, controls the supply of dentists and, and and doctors in the U.S.? Is it the 
federal government? Well, Randy, you're, you're here. Not now. <laughs> R- Randy, who controls the, the pipeline for medical students, for doctors? Well, I'm probably the AMA. But I, I the AMA, the you. American Medical Association. It's not the federal government. It's a private entity that mm-hmm. creates artificial scarcity in the system, right? Uh, it, it, you know, of course, once you ha- when, when you have, you know, exclusive power to control the pipeline and to control prices and to, you know, self-regulate, we get an exclusive industry with exclusive services with very high costs, right? So, you know, don't worry about the federal government, worry about the AMA, right? How can the federal government work productively with cities and counties to help implement the programs that we're going to need. Words to that effect. I'm no longer in the chat. I'm having trouble with it. That's right. Thank you. Yeah, very good. So, uh, you know, again, we said federally funded, locally implemented. So the job of of local cities and municipalities and community organizations is to actually identify the needs uh, and identify the existing resources. So think of a matchmaking process where you identify what the community needs at the local level. We identify the, the resources that are available to us, including um, you know, private sector, productive resources, and especially skills at the local level. And if we have the existing skills in the, in the local community, the, the management skills, the, the, the implementation uh, skills, and what we need is federal funding, then federal funding comes from the federal government and the implementation takes place. But if there is a shortage of productive capacity, if there is a shortage of skills needed to introduce those programs, then there's room for on the job paid training. There's room for, you know, building and producing those uh, skills and resources locally. And those are things that the federal government can't just throw money at, right? These are things that need to be identified at the local level with all the standard procedures, because what we're talking about here is, is we're not inventing anything new. We already have federal grants. We already have federal programs that funnel very scarce financial resources at the local level. What we're saying is, you know, there's much larger spending capacity that can absorb more employment, that can be transformative at the local level. So uh, ending kind of the myth of money is scarce and we have no financial resources to do X, Y, Z. But the local uh, administration is gonna be extremely important. Uh, and, and there's gonna to have to be checks and balances. And this, there has to be a way uh, for communities to hold their local elected officials accountable um, so that not all the money goes to the usual contractors to you know, gentrify local communities in the same way it's been done the last 20, 30 years. So, you know, it will, the implementation will vary from district to district, and we just have to set higher standards. And that's why federal money has to come with strings attached that guarantee participatory democracy at the local level, that guarantee transparency uh, and, uh, and fairness in the way money is spent in the local community. You were talking about uh, energy sovereignty and that uh, certain countries have it and some don't. Uh, and my, my question is, if a country needs sufficient currency sovereignty to use MNT, uh, how many countries qualify and what can we do for the ones that don't have it? Yeah, so, so I didn't cover this today, uh, but I, I do cover this in uh, my, my, um, you know, my day job, as I say, my, my other work. So some countries have high degrees of monetary sovereignty. Think of the US, Canada, the UK, Australia, and Japan, and so on. And some developing countries have very limited uh, spending capacity. So they can't afford a Green New Deal. And part of my work, if, if you've seen some of my work recently, is talking about a global Green New Deal in which we introduce something like climate reparations, transfer of financial resources and technology to the global south, uh, and colonial reparations in many cases uh, to repair the damage of colonialism and neo- neocolonial policies. This is just it in, in two sentences, but there's much more to it. And the, the way I make the case for, for reparations uh, in, in, in two sentences is the following. If you take the global south and global north as two separate blocks, and figure out all the financial transactions going back and forth annually, including uh, transfer of, uh, you know, um, 
a charity and a trade and interest payments and debt cancellation, all of it. You cancel all of it out. It turns out that the net amount is $2 trillion annually moving from the poorest countries to the richest countries. That's just wrong. It's just a broken system, right? So reparations has to do with reversing that flow. And that number is growing, by the way. It's, it's growing uh, for the last 20, 30 years. Um, number two, if you separate the global north and global south in general, you figure out who's responsible for most CO2 emissions historically, it's the global north. If you sort out you know, who's most responsible in terms of carbon footprint, carbon footprint for consumer goods, again, uh, it's the global north. If you figure out who's most responsible for um, colonial damage, it's the global north. So there's, there's a legal, moral, ethical, economic case to be made for a global Green New Deal under this uh, reparations program. Reparations, not just in terms of transfer of money, but transfer of technological resources uh, and productive capacity, because we're all in this together. Uh, we're not gonna save the planet. We're not gonna address these issues if only a handful of countries do it, right? So to me, ultimately, this has to be a global Green New Deal. Today, I, I emphasized just the U.S. portion of it. But this is something that the U.S. should have done 30 years ago, that Canada should have done 20 years ago, that Japan could have done 25 years ago. This is, you know, way um, long overdue. Thanks for the question, uh, Terry. Thanks, Professor Kaboob. Uh, my question is, how do we know if we have the raw materials necessary to increase our productive capacity in key sectors? For example, the USA imports a lot of its lumber from Canada. So how would we measure how easy or difficult it would be to either import or harvest yeah. the extra lumber we would need to build the additional hospitals, houses, and schools that an sure. MMT-informed Green New Deal would require? Right. Uh, so two things. One is I didn't get a chance to say anything about research and development uh, and the importance of research and development, uh, and especially material science research. Uh, for, from a sustainability standpoint, because if we're actually successful at, you know, launching a massive Green New Deal in the U.S. and Canada and other places, just think of the, the mining impact and the ecological impact for mining for rare earth materials and, and other materials. It's just going to be devastating, especially in the global south. Right. Um, so it is not sustainable. We don't even know yet or have the technological uh, capabilities to process and recycle the solar panels that we have today. In 30 years, they're gonna be obsolete. What are we gonna do with the poisonous stuff in them, right? So we need, as part of a Green New Deal, a massive investment in research and development and material science research in particular um, to, to move us towards what, what we call a circular economy, where every product that you buy from, from a store comes with a little user manual, the, the same thing that you get in a box today, but also comes with a living will that says, this is what you do with me when you're done with me, right? This is how my inputs will re-enter the circular economy. And obviously we have to build the entire infrastructure for that circular economy, right? So uh, that's, that's one component in terms of the, the materials and, and, and the importance of research and development, because the technology we have today, today is good, but not good enough. Right. We, we need to uh, figure this out in the next uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, your other question about how do we know, you know how much we need for uh, it, in economics, we have something called input output tables. Um, you know, and, and companies do strategic planning, industrial planning. Um, we have the, the technical tools to figure out how much is needed for building additional hospitals, for building more roads. Uh, so this is what uh, an organization like the CBO should be working on. So what does the CBO do today? Congressional Budget Office. They work for Congress, right? They, they hand them this bill that says, we're going to build infrastructure. And what does CBO do? They look at the impact on the deficit and the national debt in the next few years. Uh, and it, an MMT-informed CBO will be looking at the inflation risk related to the shortage of real productive capacity that will take place if we overshoot the spending in a particular industry, right? So uh, we, we need a small army of economists like CBO to do this kind of work. We, we, we have the framework for it. We need people to work on it, right? And, and 
all it takes is for Congress to mandate to their staff, which is CBO, they work for Congress, to answer the following questions. Tell us, what does it take for us to reduce poverty? What does it take for us to decarbonize the economy in terms of resources? And what will be the inflationary repercussions of the existing market power? And tell us, how do we mitigate that market power? How do we mitigate the, the risk of inflation? And that's the job of, of the 535 people we elect in Congress, is to figure out how to democratize the market so we can, again, remove those forces that suffocate the economy and suffocate the spending capacity. Very good question, Jonathan. Do you think that those who advance austerity policies, those who follow them, okay, whether uh, they be correctly informed or not, folks like, you know, say Peter G. Peterson, who I know you're familiar with, yeah. that they would not continue to resist MMT's revealed truths, even if they understood them, given that many of them have a vested interest in a credit-driven economy, okay? I'm particularly thinking about the private equity sector here, okay? All of this, despite the fact that leveraging MMT is otherwise great for business, right? Capitalism runs on sales, using up all the fiscal space available before hitting runaway inflation in an economy will increase aggregate demand, okay? Mm -hmm. And a number of your former mentors and current colleagues, including Dr. Stephanie Kelton, have grappled with this question, either publicly or through private correspondence, including with myself, actually. And um, I have, however, yet to hear from you on this, that I've yet to hear from you even touching this political challenge, right? And it's really a question, this is my last point on it, it's really a question about simple and willful ignorance versus concerted effort to vested interest when it comes sure. to MMT resistance? That's Very good question. So uh, I'll take it in, in two parts. Let's assume for a second it's, it's, it's ignorance, right? Um, if it's ignorance, then the, the mainstream approach makes perfect sense, right? They want to protect their interest. They want to protect the economy from inflation, from bankruptcy, from, from chaos. So it makes perfect sense that they would apply austerity policies. But if they truly understand what MMT is saying, especially if they've listened to the part that I uh, covered today about the, the importance of taxing and regulating the abusive price setting behavior, the market control, the forces that suffocate the economy for no good reason other than control and dominance, then they definitely don't like MMT because it's attacking their market power. Uh, and, and that's the, the political part of, of my argument here. I'm not saying that all MMTers present this part in the same way, but there's quite a few MMTers, myself, Bill Black and, and others. It's just different people have slightly different emphasis in different parts. And I tend to get you know, political. I'm totally comfortable with this. Uh, and I think for the, the people in, in this uh, income group who, um, who understand MMT, they understand how dangerous it is. Because it's one thing to have, you know, angry people protesting Wall Street and occupying Wall Street, but not really knowing, you know, what, what the tools are. It's another thing to have well-informed pitchforks who say, you know what, we're going to tax and regulate your market power out of existence, not because we need your money or your permission to have healthcare or education or, or a Green New Deal, but because we want to save democracy from your oligarchic power, because we want to reduce inequality, because we want to remove your abusive price setting behavior, then you can't call their bluff. Then they're, they're coming at you with, you know, and they're, and they're pinching where it hurts, as, uh, as they say. So I think this is, um, I, I hope this answers your question, Sam. But, but Fadl, what about the private equity sector? Don't you agree that they also have a vested interest in resisting MMT, even if they understood it? Uh, tell me more. Why, okay. why would so that? Okay, Peter, so Peter G. Peterson, I think, is a great example, and I was delighted to hear Stephanie Kelton give that example in an interview with Yanis Varoufakis a couple of months ago. She said, look, this is a guy who makes his living when companies go bust. Right? Sure. When you have a credit bubble and there isn't enough aggregate demand and an economy and certain businesses and certain sectors go us as a result, Peter G. Peterson swoops in and makes a killing. So even if he understood it, don't you think that he has a vested interest in ensuring that all those people who have bought into the austerity narrative out of ignorance, simple or willful, is going to continue to oh. promulgate that view? 
Of course, if your business model is, is short selling and taking advantage of a downturn and, you know, different portions of the economy and MMT says, well, wait a minute, this, this economic pain and this downturn doesn't actually have to happen, then you're taking away his arbitrage opportunity, his speculative opportunity. Yeah, makes per- that's why I said MMT is dangerous for those individuals, especially when they understand it, right? When they understand that the austerity is... 100%. Is, yeah. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. 100%. Thank you. I'm not an authority on donut economics or regenerative mm-hmm. economics, but circular economics and regenerative economics seem uh, uh, synonymous. Are they, is my question. And then number two, how does MMT fit into the donut economics uh, concept? As a... Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned this. Uh, Randy or, or maybe uh, somebody else who has the link to the article that I sent you guys to share uh, with the webinar. Um, uh, this new piece I just published this uh, last week on MMT, the Green New Deal and and the opportunity for the Biden administration. In it, I actually link and, and comment on donut economics and MMT. Uh, absolutely. You know, as, as far as I'm concerned, uh, Stephanie's book and, and Kate Roth's uh, book are, are golden resources that will save humanity if we put them to work, right, <laughs> and hand them to the Biden administration uh, today. Uh, and that's where, you know, when I made a comment a little bit ago about, uh, you know, every product needs to come with a living will, uh, that's what I mean. Um, and my comments about shifting away from GDP to GPI, absolutely. Uh, now, does that mean that every MMT economist in every presentation, they talk about uh, sustainability and consumerism and all of these things? No, because a lot of the MMT, you know, uh, struggle for the last 20 years is to get people to understand the basics, right? Um, I, over time, managed to figure out a way to squeeze everything in as quickly as I can to make sure that, you know, at the end of the presentation, people recognize that MMT is not about unlimited economic growth and unlimited spending to emphasize the, the real limits and the real challenges that actually matter, right? Um, so thank you again for, for raising this question. And, and Randy, I don't know if you found that article. If not, I'll, I'll post it in, in yeah, the chat. Yeah, we shared it. In fact, it just got reposted now. Thank you. Appreciate it. One of the keys to implementing the Green New Deal seems to be the, the jobs guarantee. Um, if someone is a apprentice, say, in a job that's guaranteed by that program, and they just cannot succeed at it, um, how does that work and how will it be handled? Obviously, in the private enterprise, that person will be fired and then they go on unemployment insurance. But since this is a nationwide program with much larger implications, implica- implications. I'd like to know how this could actually work in practice, please. Very good question. Um, again, a part that I didn't get a chance to, to cover today, but my uh, idea of a job guarantee, and because of the work that I do here in Ohio, working with um, uh, you know, members of the community that have you know, suffered from socioeconomic exclusion of the opioid crisis and uh, you know, the incarceration, mental health issues, you name it. When you talk about a job guarantee and say, we're going to pay you a decent wage and it's going to be guaranteed and you show up at nine and there's going to be a job for you. The first thing they say, well, what if I can't stay focused? I have a mental health issue. I have a- an addiction problem. I'm not going to be able to stay on the training program. I need a whole set of resources, complementary resources to allow people to thrive on the job. So the example that you mentioned, if somebody is not successful or is just this particular apprenticeship program is not working, it is our responsibility not to set people up for failure. So we're talking about mental health assistance, housing assistance, um, uh, recovery uh, from addiction assistance, and job counseling, family counseling, all kinds of resources to allow people to find the best match for their capabilities, for uh, for their potential. Uh, So the goal here is not to give up on people, but just set them up with one opportunity, you fail, you're out, which is what the private sector does. Can I just follow up with that? Because I understand you're talking about extreme situations. I'm thinking about the coal miner who's 50 years old and now 
loses his job and he goes through an apprenticeship program, but he just doesn't have the skills or he's, you know, he's past a certain stage of learning right. and he just can't succeed in, let's say it's the solar industry. How right. is he handled in that system? So this is something um, uh, I, I encourage people to take a look at reimaginingappalachia.org, which is a, a coalition of 100 uh, plus organizations from Ohio, Pennsylvania, Kentucky, and West Virginia uh, that I'm happy to be part of. Uh, and think of it as a mini Green New Deal for the region. And a core feature of the work that we're doing is the concept of just transition for coal miners, for workers in the fossil fuel industry. We're working with environmentalists and labor unions from the fossil fuel industry to figure out a path to, to transition. Because you know, when you think of coal miners and workers in the fossil fuel industry, they're not necessarily in love with the pollution, right? They're in love with the six-figure paying job, right? That provides income security and, and so on. So when we talk about a just transition, we're not telling people, you know, go learn how to code, move to San Francisco. That's a job guarantee, right? That's a just transition. Of course not. We're talking about a just transition, especially for the most senior workers close to retirement by guaranteeing the same benefits and income package. And that's something that the federal government has to foot the bill on. Because we're talking about relatively small number of workers, you know, nationwide who are in that category and we can't just throw them under the bus, right? So transferable skills is the name of the game. So experienced um, uh, fracking industry workers are really good at drilling, right? And what else do we need to do is to lay cables, fiber optics, modernize the grid, bury it underground, right? It's much safer, much cleaner, and much more sustainable, right? And it's easier work than the actual dangerous fracking work, right? Uh, guaranteeing a transition while building the infrastructure for the next 100 years for the U.S. economy. So we have to be creative in taking workers as they are, where they are, finding the transferable skills and matching their needs and their aspirations, career aspirations, and underwriting the financial cost of that transition for the most senior workers. For the younger people who are unemployed today, they can enter the solar industry, the wind in industry, and the salaries, the starting salaries are at 60 and 75 and 85. They don't have to start with the six figure salaries, right? It's, it's really the fossil fuel workers who are making six figures and they hear politicians telling them, well, the solar jobs are good. They pay 75, right? They don't pay 120, 130. So thank you for, for your question. This is really the, 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 the key issue for this transition, because you know what? If we don't do that, we're gonna lose the labor unions. We're gonna use, lose the labor movement because the labor movement has been burnt before. They've been told we're gonna to transition, new industry, we're gonna outsource these jobs and there's gonna be this other things. And then what happens? They're thrown under the bus, right? By Republicans and Democrats, right? So it's totally understandable that they're skeptical, that they're defensive, but when you have honest conversations about where the world is moving, where the industry is moving, and what the needs of the American economy is, they recognize that there has to be a transition. They're just going to be in the middle of it. And if the federal government doesn't step in and do the right thing, it's going to be a disaster. Sort of a, a, a bigger thing like, you know, how the heck do we get, do we get our, con our 535 member of Congress and our communities and our world to wake up. Um, you know, it's like things are such a frigging mess. Um, uh, you know, I'm barely sort of holding on to everything you're talking about. Um, you know, it's a bit high level. I mean, I'm, I'm getting it, but um, you know, the whole political will thing and, you know, like you say, paradigm shift, major paradigm shift, like how do right. we do this? Uh, we've been doing this for in the MMT community for 25 years. <laughs> uh, we're finally making some some progress. Um, you know, people are listening. People in Congress are are listening. Uh, I, I sort of classify them in in different categories. You, you have the AOCs and the Cory Bookers and and the Jamal Bowmans who understand this, who get it, right? Um, but they're a minority. Then you have you know, uh, a silent 
you know, bunch who understand this, who heard this behind closed doors, but are hesitant to come out and embrace it. But they would if there is that critical mass, if we reach that critical mass. And then there is the, the hardcore, you know, conservative blue dogs and the Democratic Party and the fiscally conservative. Uh, and, and those come in different varieties. Some are just, you know, completely, um, uh, you know, convinced that none of this makes sense, that fiscal conservatism is, is, uh, is, is absolutely what the country needs to follow. Uh, and others, as Sam alluded to earlier in, in his question, totally get it and realize that this is not just a paradigm shift, this is a balance of power shift. Right. Because what we're saying is, you know, if, if the forces that are suffocating the economy are essentially those super PACs that underwrite your political campaign, are you gonna bite the hand that, that feeds you? Right. Uh, and that's why we're calling and we're working on, you know, creating a brand new Congress. Or many of us here are part of a brand new Congress uh, organization that's actually um, you know, committed to bringing in new candidates who understand this, number one, who also commit to not taking money for, from super PACs and who know what the, what the real possibilities are. Uh, and if we're serious about democracy, forget about all of this MMT stuff. If we're serious about democracy, it's a government of the people, by the people, for the people. It's not a government of the super PACs, by the super PACs, for the super PACs. So let's just stay focused on that. And when it comes to the real issues that matter, and polling numbers are very clear when it comes to you know, universal health care, the vast majority of Americans are in favor of it. Who opposes it? It's mostly politicians in D.C., the super PACs that uh, fund them, uh, the, the lobbyists that support them, the media companies that spin their stories, right? That's a minority. Right? The majority of the American public is in favor of universal health care. That's a problem of, of, of a democratic you know, representation, right? a government of the people, by the people, for the people. So I'll, I think that's a challenge for us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We can talk about politicians, but it seems to me that really, if you want to tip um, public opinion that there needs to be better media literacy because, sure. you know, politicians go on CNN or whatever and they get interviewed by people like Chuck Todd who are still totally saturated and immersed in the old monetary ideology. And I think if we really want people, want there to be a broader discourse that accepts what you're talking about, that the media yep. is a really important role to play in that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and many of us in the, in the MMT community have been aware of this, have been told this from the beginning by actual, you know, Congress people who say, well, get me a critical mass of constituents who understand this. Get me a critical mass of media people who can actually mm -hmm. you know, help, you know, spread these ideas. And then I'll come out and say these things and embrace these things. And the joke at the time was, if we have that critical mass, we'll vote you out of office and we'll get the better person. Right. <laughs> right? But, but how is that happening? But, but, it's, but it's a fundamental question. Uh, yeah. it, it's very important. And at this point, we do have a handful of media people who understand this. Okay. And major publications, you know, major news networks and major newspapers. Uh, we're not dominant yet. We, don't, we haven't shifted the narrative yet. But at some point, we'll get to that turning point. And I'll, I'll tell you why I'm, I'm optimistic. Because in the last couple of years, and when, when we started with, with the big push on, on the Green New Deal and MMT, and then the pushback came from the mainstream economists, people like Larry Summers and Krugman and so on. This is what the mainstream journalists, professional journalists, who have nothing to do with MMT, have to say. Mm -hmm. That, wait a minute, Larry Summers, we heard you. You said you don't like MMT. You think that this is going to be, you know, some voodoo economics or whatever, but you really haven't told us why. And you haven't mm -hmm. even made the case for your argument. And at the same time, we've heard these MMT economists who are making sense on inflation or making sense on the deficit. That it seems like, you know, reality actually reflects what they've been saying. So we don't know much about this MMT thing. Sure enough, it's weird and strange and new but we're going to keep listening because they're making sense. Well, so lately, it's the burden of responsibility yeah. is on the mainstream now to figure out what causes inflation, to figure out why is the deficit not bankrupting the country, to figure out why interest rates are not skyrocketing like they told us several years ago. 
You're right? seeing so this think, in the New York Times right now. Like even Krugman and Freeman are coming out, you know, much more, much more in support of your position than they have been traditionally. There, it's. I see a big shift in those New York Times articles and Washington Post, and you know that level of the traditional media seems to be moving yeah. there's movement happening i know it's not exactly what you want but it's yeah better. yeah i mean supporting the policies for now i underlined for now because yeah. interest rates are low right but they're mm -hmm. going to reverse immediately as soon as interest rates are, are high and, and they already told us right it'll if interest rates late. were higher we wouldn't spend right they because know we'll that be it'll be too late when that happens right exactly <laughs> but we'll, we'll just have to your... keep at it yeah thank, thank you, you thanks much. for your comment I have this uncomfortable feeling in my stomach that the concept of sovereign money mm -hmm. really came out of colonialism and privilege. And that there's, it's not an accident that the countries in the North have sovereign money, whereas the countries in the South do not. And it feels to me like giving ourselves the liberty to spend like that really reinforces those gaps. I know you've acknowledged that right. we will be spending to the benefit of the whole world and we need a global Green New Deal, but I just don't see why we're going to give up our privilege and our benefit for that to happen. And I wonder if you have thoughts or strategies to sure. keep that discussion on the table. Thank you for, for raising that question. And, and as uh, many of you know, this is, a, this is a topic that's near and dear to, to my heart. I spend a lot of time <laughs> working on it when I'm not talking about the, the U.S. context. Uh, you're absolutely right. This, the, the higher degree of monetary sovereignty that people, that countries in the global north have acquired has to do with, with abuse, <laughs> uh, with colonialism, with extraction, with, uh, with, uh, with dominance in the global financial architecture that sucks trillions of dollars from the poorest countries you know, every, every year, as I, as I mentioned. So I, I posted a, a brief article here in the New Internationalist in which I, I sketched this, uh, um, you know, my vision for a global Green New Deal. Um, so to answer your question directly in terms of why, what's in it for us uh, in terms of doing this, uh, again, think of the alternative. The cost of doing nothing globally uh, is, is just a disaster. I'll give you one example, which I talk about when I discuss uh, the framework of a global Green New Deal. Uh, think of um, what we call uh, the carbon bubble. So you're, you're familiar with the stock market bubble when assets are overinflated and then we have a market collapse. Well, the carbon bubble has to do with the assets that are associated, that their value is determined by the carbon economy, the fossil fuel economy. Think of all the coastal properties, the hotels and resorts that will be flooded permanently, right? Hundreds of billions of dollars worth of property in 30 and 40 and 50 years that will go from hundreds of billions of dollars to zero, right? In, in value, right? That's gonna be, think of all the fossil fuel infrastructure, the carbon economy that will become obsolete because solar and wind and geothermal is going to displace those, you know, that infrastructure. Again, all of those assets are priced in. Even some of the oil, the proven reserves that are still underground, are priced in in the market value of, of oil companies. All of those will become stranded assets. And it's estimated to be, you know, 20, 30 trillion dollars, possibly more likely more. But let's say 25 trillion dollars. All of it is in the global north, right? So now you have the financial industry itself, the insurance companies themselves, panicking, literally panicking in the last couple of years because they did their homework behind closed doors, behind the scenes, and they said, and this is not me, these are leaked reports from JP Morgan and others who said the IPCC report, the you know, predictions that they're giving us, those guys are optimistic. It's actually much, much worse than that, right? So... Um, so what's in it for us? It's the, it's the collapse of the economy. It's the collapse of the ecosystem. It's the biodiversity. It's, it's the end of life on earth, right? So we have to do it. And that's why I'm trying to um, design this global Green New Deal framework with reparation so that we do this with justice, right? So that we don't do this just because it's, you know, we, we want to, you know, 
uh, build a, a big bubble for us in the global north and, and survive the, the climate catastrophe? Yeah, my uh, next question is just what is the uh, Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity working on right now? What new uh, research and models should we be looking forward to in the coming months? So um, many of the things we work on are, are uh, uh, I'll, I'll share a quick link here to uh, an article, uh, a brief op-ed that we uh, just published recently uh, on the Green Jobs uh, Report uh, that um, my colleagues and I work on. Uh, what we're finding essentially is that greener jobs uh, are, pay better. They're more resilient during the recession. They recover faster when the economy improves. And even during the pandemic, they're safer when you look at you know, high contact in industries versus low contact industries. So this is some of the work that we do. If you, if you go to esgx.org, you can sign up for our next webinar, which is tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern to get the latest uh, update. And we'll be discussing reimagining Appalachia actually tomorrow uh, with our green jobs uh, report with uh, a couple of guest speakers from, uh, from reimagining Appalachia. Um, uh, the big things that we w are working on is an empirical model for that spectrum of monetary sovereignty to be able to quantify the fiscal policy space, the risk of inflation for different countries. And as a result, be able to rate countries based on their degree of monetary sovereignty. That's a mega project that's going to take us, you know, several years, but we're building it, you know, one block at a time with uh, Scott Fulweiler and uh, and a handful of PhD students at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Uh, the other thing that we are hoping to launch, uh, hoping to get some funding for grad students to, uh, to crunch the numbers and do the work is uh, a study on the cost of doing nothing, kind of quantifying the health costs, the, the cost of incarceration, the cost of the opioid crisis, all of these things, and essentially go to policymakers with, with, a, with a single page document that says, here's the cost of doing nothing, and this is what we're paying for right now, and here's the cost of a Green New Deal, here's the cost of a job guarantee. Which one would you rather pay for, right? You know, forget about MMT, forget about all this thing. And this is the kind of language that the, the average Joe, again, understands, right? We'd rather pay for the cheap version and get the good jobs and get the better quality of life. So we're trying to quantify that. And then the other thing that we, again, would, would love to get some funding to, you know, put some grad students to, to crunch the numbers and, and produce this is the GPI uh, for every state in the United States, historical data, and then be able to update it every, every quarter and get a new metric permanently available for free for all of us. And again, it becomes that color-coded picture in your face. You can't deny it that says, here's GDP, here's GPI, you know. Why don't you invest in the things that improve my quality of life? And we're able to do this by income level. And once you do that, you realize that quality of life for the lowest income individuals has actually been deteriorating, not even flat. Right? So these are the things that we're hoping will be game changers in shifting the narrative with, with the general public um, uh, beyond the MMT framework, which is obviously crucial to you know, everything I explained, but there's these other building blocks that are very important, I think, uh, to shift the narrative and, and, and help us move this forward. That sounds really Thanks great, especially uh, the idea of having the index for fiscal space. It'll be really cool to show people this is exactly how we know we have fiscal space and, and not have to just talk about uh, it in generalities. Yeah. Yeah, that, again, that's what I call the, the mega monster project. It's, it's going to be the, the biggest one, probably. It's going to take us years to build it, unless we get a small army of grad students to help us move this faster. <laughs> well, let me, let me know if you need volunteers. <laughs> well, we'd like to pay people to do this work and, and get their degrees at the same time. Uh, volunteers are, are welcome, but um, you know, we, we, we want people to, to make a decent living while doing this work, too. <laughs> Thank you very much. I was just doing a presentation to some folks in Maryland and I catch you in the end here. And, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, we've been working on is the concept of using the existing rail corridors for renewable energy transmission and uh, increase in moving uh, freight off of trucks and onto trains um, and uh, expanding that capacity.
But the um, the railroad companies are don't want to consider themselves as common carriers any longer. They don't want to consider that interstate um, infrastructure to have any for the public to have any claim on it. Or um, and they are they're so captured by short term profits in Wall Street that they're actually mining it for its its you know 150 years of investments that have been made. And then what you were just talking about made me think. Well, there's there's a mon there's a way there's a value that we're losing when we have corporations that are extracting value rather than adding value, or as I've heard in some of these conversations, balancing the society or balancing the economy, and they're forcing us into uh, into. Um, into tra tragedy and they're costing the public our own well-being our future well-being mm -hmm. and so like I, I when i started hearing about mmt i'm like well okay that's the that's part of the rationale to then have a national movement to buy back those corridors and and rationalize and uh, an efficient mm -hmm. interstate transportation and transmission infrastructure that works in alongside the, the, the federal, you know, highway system. And Absolutely. it felt yeah. radical when I first started wondering about this, but now I feel like it's just freaking common sense. And I'm just uh, curious to begin a dialogue with you about, does, sure. do you see a fit for that kind of infrastructural um, uh, uh, decor yeah. change? Yeah. Uh I, I think many people are going to hear me say this many, many times in, in the next four years, at least common sense for the average Joe, right? Seriously. Uh, unintended here, right? So what we say in the MMT community, we talk about public money for the public purpose uh, in all aspects of economic activity. Uh, it starts with banking. Remember, banks don't operate without a banking license. Who gives them the banking license? The federal government. And they're supposed to serve the public purpose. If they don't serve the public purpose, you can take away their license, right? Same thing when it comes to, you know, um, uh, public utilities, right? So we're talking about, it, we use eminent domain laws to take over private property, right? For public interest. And guess what? We do this for fracking companies, sure. right? To allow them to put pipelines to pollute the water sources. We can do this for the public purpose without destroying the environment and without suffocating the economy and abusing consumers. So this is, we're on the same page when it comes to these issues. There's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done across the board in, in the broadband industry and in, in, in big tech and in, uh, in, uh, transportation and, and so on. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to ask him about the military industrial complex. How do we solve that uh, industry? Yeah, I think it, it has to do with uh, with setting our national priorities straight, right? And and I'm glad you mentioned this because I sometimes forget to answer this question um, preemptively because it, it's always a question that comes up because there's uh, there are many people with the, with all the good intentions who link, you know, downsizing the military budget with what it takes to fund a Green New Deal. In other words, if we, if we don't reduce the military budget, we will not have a Green New Deal because money is scarce. And if the military takes 75% of it, then we're only left with 25%. That is just wrong, absolutely wrong. It's not about finding the money. Again, it's about the real productive capacity. Now, if the military happens to absorb the best engineering capabilities that we would need for rebuilding the grid and rebuilding a, an efficient transportation system and doing the research and development we need for material science research for a circular economy, then by all means, take those resources from them. I mean the engineers, the brain power, not the money. The money doesn't matter. It's the real productive resources that matter. Sometimes I joke, um, and I have to be careful because these things are recorded these days, so I, I insist. <laughs> And I repeat, I am joking, right? It's a joke. I always say, if we wanted to invade Canada and have a Green New Deal, we probably can. It doesn't mean we should, right? <laughs> but uh, you get what I mean, right? It's not about downsizing the military, right? There's all kinds of reasons 
for which we need to reduce the imperialistic capabilities of the United States and all of the, you know, I, I grew up in the Middle East. If, you know, it's a, it's a whole talk for another day. Um, so don't get me started on that front. Um, but we should not say that the Green New Deal, healthcare for all, all of these transformative programs require reducing the military budget in order to have a better healthcare system and so on. So focus on the real resources. Um, and, and I'll close by saying this. Um, many of my good liberal friends back in the you know, uh, Iraq uh, invasion days used to say, we shouldn't invade Iraq, it's too expensive. We can't afford it. And I was like, so if, if we can afford it, it's okay to do it. <laughs> so set the priorities straight, including the moral priorities straight and then figure out how to mobilize the resources for it and how to organize society to deliver the best outcome. Well, I like your idea about uh, pulling the uh, availability out of the military for our own good, goods and- uh, Oh, it's not just the military. Deal. I mean, the private sector too absorbs oh, a yeah. lot of brain power for very little value when it comes to, we're facing a climate crisis and we have a small army of really smart people developing video games. Oh, sorry for all video games fans, <laughs> but I think we need to set our priorities straight. I agree. Absolutely. Great. Listen, everybody, thank you so much for being here. And Fadl, I'm always, imp I mean, I know how brilliant you were, but I'm also really impressed how generous you are with your time. Thank and you. really, really want to thank you for being here tonight. It really was an excellent talk. And we'll show the video around town. Be very helpful. And again, just very, very thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Take care.